Good evening and uh, welcome to the Institute on this uh, snowy April evening. Uh, it's a distinct honor and pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Stephen Kotkin for his second in a series of three lectures. Um, Professor Kotkin was introduced to you uh, at his first lecture by my colleague and director of the Institute, Shalini Randeira, and uh, he will also give his third lecture exactly at the same time next week on Wednesday. Um, this was supposed to be introduced by, by my colleague and friend, uh, Ivan Krastev, so you only have the Ivan part of the Krastev. <laughs> I'm Ivan Vevoda, also a permanent fellow here. And uh, we will follow the same routine as last time, for those of you who were here. Uh, Professor Kotkin will speak tonight on the issue of what, if anything, is the difference between fascism and communism, a, f a fascinating topic. Uh, he is uh, known to you um, as a great expert on, on Russia, on history, on international affairs. He's also uh, associated with the Hoover Institution at uh, Stanford. And uh, after publishing the first volume uh, on Stalin, he is here preparing uh, the publication of the second volume, which I guess will come out in the fall. So, Professor Kotkin, please. Thank you. Thank you once again for the honor of the invitation to come to the Institute and give these lectures. I commend all of you for being here, given that uh, this is, after all, the second lecture, and the weather shows that we are in an intellectual winter, which will be part of the theme of the lecture. So the weather is entirely appropriate. So Boris Yeltsin was at a press conference, and a journalist that raised his hand called on him and asked him, Boris Yeltsin, Boris Nikolaevich, can you sum up the situation in Russia in one word? He said, good, хорошо. The journalist asked for a follow-up question. He said, Boris Nikolaevich, can you sum up the situation in Russia in two words? Not good. Не <laughs> хорошо. <laughs> As you can see, I left a lot of time for questions again. That's it. I failed to capture all the people who fled the country prior to the first lecture. As you can see, Krastev is still at large. But in case we need to take hostages, I brought the duct tape. So I'll just warn you. Now, what is the difference between communism and fascism? It's pretty simple. Communism is over. That's the difference. That will be what I'll try to prove in the lecture today. We have from the right a story of totalitarianism, where communism and fascism are essentially equivalents. We have from the left a story of communism as anti-fascism. But instead of these mythologies, there is a different story. There's a story of illiberalism, self-enrichment, and discovery. And that's the story I'm going to lay out for you. I'll do it in four parts. Part one will be about certain mythologies that we hold. Part two, I'll tell an alternative story. Part three, I'll talk about China. And part four, I'll get to back to the theme of illiberalism and communism being over, but fascism not being over. So here we have 1989. 
It is the core mythology of those who lived through those events and of many institutes, including this one, and of almost the entire intellectual class. It's a wonderful story. Dissidence, resistance, overthrow, revolution, and of course, velvet revolution. And we had all those debates, and you remember them, because maybe you participated in them, about how velvety it all was. Which was more velvet? Which was more heroic? Which strategy was the most brilliant? There were awards. There was no small degree of self-congratulation. And where are we now? Where are we now? If all of that was so important, so causal, so salient, why doesn't it show its importance now? Why isn't it salient now? Why aren't dissidents so powerful now? Why isn't resistance so powerful now? Why can't we overthrow things with intellectuals now? The answer is because all of that is a myth to a very significant extent. You remember Tiananmen Square in China, also in 1989. And there were a million people in Tiananmen Square not to mention all the other cities. And here we are, today. We are 27 and a half years later, and that regime is still there. Were the Chinese protesters less courageous? Were Chinese dissidents less courageous? I don't think so. I think they were equally as courageous as the dissidents here in Eastern Europe. Absolutely. I think their protests were equally sincere. I think their intentions were equally sincere. But they could not overthrow that regime. And so that's what we have to come to grips with. We have to come to grips with where we are today in Europe, and we have to come to grips with a story, with a history, that encompasses not just Poland, or Hungary, or Czechoslovakia, but also encompasses East Asia. Because if the story doesn't work for East Asia, then maybe it doesn't work at all. The Czechoslovaks came out into the streets in November 1989. And what? This is a revolution. November 1989, they hit the streets. And somehow, it was a revolution. The Hungarian communists had to help form the other side of the round table. Do you think if the Polish communist government in 1988 had not had unpayable debts in foreign currency, they would have organized that round table and invited solidarity to that process? I don't think so. I think there are larger structural factors, and yes, geopolitics. Here we have the Soviet collapse and the East European revolution. How could it be that we have two different stories so diametrically opposite? One is a collapse and the other is a revolution. And the answer is because we, there are stories that are dear to our hearts. Some of us participated in them directly. But these stories don't work as explanation. What happened was the elites surrendered. They lost their will. They gave it up. The geopolitics didn't work anymore. And Eastern Europe embarked on a long, slow march from periphery to periphery. And that's where we are. There is a big challenge here, an intellectual challenge, beyond just 1989. You read the history, and you're thinking, how could it be? In 1989, the people brought down communism themselves with their bare hands. Their agency 
was nearly 100%. But then in the 1940s, they were not agents, they were victims. They didn't have any agency. They were invaded. The Nazis on the one side, the Soviet communists on the other. They lived in the bloodlands between those who had agency. How could it be that a people has little to no agency in the 1940s and all of a sudden total agency in the 1980s? This is a trick. It's a trick. It's a political trick that is being perpetrated upon us all. It didn't happen that way, as you know. There was plenty of agency in the 1940s. Anyone who's familiar with the work of my colleague Jan Gross can tell you all about it. And the agency in the 1980s needs to be put in the context of the structural factors and the geopolitics. Yes, there is a great story. It's a wonderful story, like I said, and these are the best people. Who doesn't think that Adam Michnik is an incredible person? Breathtaking, he might be the most amazing person I've ever met. The courage, the long history of courage, the savvy, the praxis. He taught in my class with Jan Gross at Princeton University and I got a chance to see it firsthand. There can be no doubt what kind of person Adam Michnik and others alongside him are. But that's not an explanation. Okay, so what might be the explanation? Where should we go to deliver a context, to deliver the structural factors, to put the agency in some type of story that makes sense, both for Europe and for Asia? You'll remember from the first lecture that I made several points. First, the West won the Cold War because it was a sphere of influence. It was an active, proactive sphere of influence that wanted to and forced itself into the face of the second world of communism every day. That was the strategy, and that's how the Cold War was won. Second, I argued that the West was not ready for its success. The success was astronomical, beyond anyone's wildest dreams. And now, somehow, we're in a position of losing the post-Cold War, when winning the Cold War was immensely harder. Third, I argued that the dreaded return of geopolitics, the desire to escape from geopolitics is a mistake. The right sees a benign global US hegemony, pure and above geopolitics. And the left sees a pooled sovereignty, multinational organizations, the supposed counterpoint to nasty geopolitics. But in fact, as I argued, without leadership, there is no international system. The international system is only what the most powerful country will or won't do. We have a history rich with the absence of an international system. And we could be on the verge of revisiting that history. Geopolitics is the foundation. It's the driver. It's the foundation and driver for a lot of misery. And it's also the foundation and driver for the amazing story that's Europe today and the quality of life that we all cherish. Okay, now in the third lecture, I'll take you up, deal with the present day phenomenon. The third lecture is entitled The Chip on the Shoulder. As you know, it's an idiom in English indicating resentment. You feel grievances, you feel wronged, you carry what's called a chip an invisible chip on your shoulder, and these grievances smolder. And I'll talk about those grievances, that chip on the shoulder, in terms of the international system. We talk about populism within individual countries, but I'm going to talk about it as part of the international system or the undoing of the international system. Today, in the second lecture, 
we're going to take a quick excursion back into recent history, setting up this chip on the shoulder. Third lecture. Okay, so we're still in part two, the alternative story. I just need a time check here because I'm not good with uh, stopping on time. I think I'm going to actually go all the way and remove the jacket, if that's okay. Thank you. Now that we're intimate, this being the second lecture, I think we'll give it a shot, the informality. So 55 million people died in World War II. 55 million. The number from World War I was maybe a third of that, less than a third, and it was horrific. 55 million is an absolutely impossible thing to understand. We have things like Syria today, absolutely horrific. But of course, in the context of World War II, I could talk about how many people died in specific battles, greater, just one battle, greater than the number who died in Syria today. Ironically, it was the winners who lost the most people. China lost between 10 and 13 million. They were on the winning side. And the Soviets, as you know, the estimates are about 27 million. So together between China and the Soviet Union, you have almost 40 million of the 55 million. But we don't need to revisit the details of that story. You know them. I just want to point out that that's the world we live in today. We live in the post-World War II order. It's the world that's still with us. Let me try to prove that. There was a colossal geopolitical shift in the 1940s. This colossal geopolitical shift in the 1940s was unforeseen. What we call capitalism, what we call capitalism went from fascist militarism, it went from depression and unemployment, it went from colonies around the world, imperialism, rapacious colonialism, it went from all of that to constitutional orders where there had been fascism, booming market economies where the middle class acquired housing. The working class acquired housing. My father worked in an embroidery factory, and he bought a house in the post-World War II period. There was freedom. There was economic dynamism, middle class boom. There was decolonization. The whole world shifted. And above all, there was an American uh, government and an American society populace committed to the post-World War II order. Now you may think that I have nostalgia, that I am now, as it were, putting on what they call the rose-colored glasses to look at this. But the shift was phenomenal. In the 1950s, Germany, West Germany, grew at more than 10% a year, GDP, for years on end. Japan had a phenomenal boom. There was no repeat of the Great Depression, even though that's what everyone predicted. Stalin thought it would happen again. Truman thought it would happen again. Instead, there was this middle-class boom. This middle-class economic boom produced the people in this room, including myself. There was freedom, real freedom, the kind of freedom that was underwritten by constitutional order, rule of law, independent judiciaries, competent and impartial civil service, functioning parliaments. And the decolonization process wasn't pretty. It was reluctant, but it happened. It happened. In many ways, it could have been better and should have been better, but it happened. I could go on with the details of this shift. I could talk to you about what happened in Japan, 
coming back from the ashes to become the second largest economy in the world. Can you believe that? That's just astonishing. The West German story we know well. Some of us lived it. Some of us observed it. But the Japanese story is equally breathtaking. And you can say that U.S. leadership in the international system was not always benign, and I would be the first to agree. But there's a big difference between leadership that you can criticize because of its mistakes and self-interest and the absence of leadership. Leadership is something that other countries don't like to do. They pass the buck because it's very costly, leadership of the international system. Very costly. The British have a geo strategy, a grand strategy of lowest cost possible. Get others to fight your wars. Yeah, they're calling now on the phone. The U.S. was different. We can all go through the reasons why. I'm just saying there was a shift. But one place in the world didn't shift. One place in the world did not shift at all. It was destroyed in the war. It lost about a third of its wealth. And it rebuilt itself in the inner war style. The Soviet Union reconstituted itself, which is another amazing story, in the Stalinist fashion, with heavy industry. You know, when Stalin died and Khrushchev took over, there were 1.5 socks per person in the Soviet economy. 1.5 socks. Like you, I have two feet and I need two socks. So 1.5 per capita wasn't going to work. Especially if anybody had three or four socks. There were women with no husbands who wanted to have children anyway. It's a story that's heart-rendering. But it's a story of reconstitution of the Soviet system. The world decolonizes, the Soviet Union acquires the satellite states. It's outer empire, as Orwell called it. Fascism is defeated, the stormtroopers are defeated. Communism keeps its KGB, its coercive mechanisms. The world moves to dynamic market economies. Communism rebets doubles down on the planned economy. And I could go on, but this gigantic geopolitical shift, one country didn't shift because it felt it won the war, which was true. And that's why they have the UN veto, because they earned it in the Security Council. They won that war. But there's a tragic dimension to winning the war, because it ratified the system. It ratified Stalin's rule. And when the rest of the world went in what we call the West, the direction of the West, communism didn't. And now communism is in a geopolitical competition with this West. And it's not really a fair competition. Let's think about this for a second. You know sometimes when you play uh, football and it's a group of people you may not know or you know only a little bit, and the teams are not formed yet, and you pick two captains, and then the captains each get to choose their squad from the players. And so the United States says, okay, let's start. I'll take Japan. Soviet Union says, all right, um, I'll take Romania. And then the United States says, okay, I'll take Britain. Soviet Union says, okay, I'll take Bulgaria. And then the United States says, all right, I'll take France. So he says, okay, that's good. I get Hungary. And then it goes all the way, West Germany, East Germany. And these are the two sides. Now you tell me, thinking about that, even prospectively rather than retrospectively, what type of competition that's going to be. Not much of a competition if the side that's the West understands what it is has willpower, understands it's a sphere of influence, and pushes itself in the face of what was called the second world, or communism. And that's exactly what happened. Communism was crushed in a daily life competition. 
It was absolutely crushed. You know David Reisman? Some of you will be familiar with Lonely Crowd, David Reisman. In 1951, he wrote a satire called, quote, The Nylon War. Nylons are stockings that women wear. And he said that the Americans were going to bomb the Soviet Union, not with explosives, but with consumer goods in Operation Abundance. They were going to drop nylon hose and radios and wristwatches and toasters and sewing machines and refrigerators and jeeps. And the Russian people, the Soviet people, he wrote, were going to see all of this and they were going to capitulate. It was a satire. 1951. Well, guess what? That's what happened. Only we didn't drop it. We just built it up and we showed it to them. And they could see it. They could see it in the proverbial vitrine. They could see it in the shop window. They couldn't have it, but they could see it. And on it went. Chemical perms from beauty parlors, children's clothes and children's toys. You could go on and you could go on. Bananas, oranges. It was a daily life competition. And it seeped and it seeped on purpose behind that iron curtain into the second world because we pushed it in their face and because they were susceptible. The Western sphere of influence invaded the Soviet bloc, invaded it with consumer goods, invaded it with freedom, invaded it with who we are. Sometimes we lost our way, we lost our will. Sometimes we forgot who we were. And there were moments, as I was talking about in the first lecture, the 1970s, the Vietnam War, the oil shock, Nixon and Watergate, right? where many people thought the Soviets were the dynamic side and that the West was collapsing. Consider for a second East Germany. Consider East Germany. And of course they had, as it was called, imperialist hate on their televisions every night, as those of you who grew up in East Germany will know. They could watch the West German television, imperialist hate, as they called it. Let's think about them. The East German elite, they wore Western suits. They wore Western shoes. They had Western toys for their children. They had Western perfume for their wives and mistresses. All of it produced by wage slavery in the capitalist world. The political mafia all over the globe drives a Mercedes. The East Germans could not quite bring themselves, so they imported Volvos. And the compound where the elites lived was called what? It was called Volvograd, because that was their car of choice. Their entire life, their entire existence, the East German nomenclatura was completely suffused by Western products, by Western luxury goods, by not even luxury goods, by simple goods. And this was a symbol of their status. That's how they differentiated themselves. Now you ask yourself, how could it be that that side could allow could allow such complete and total suffusion of the Western sphere of influence so that it marked their status behind the Iron Curtain. That's right. It was a really big problem. You see, because what was that world? That world was the antidote to capitalism. You see, there was no reason for East Germany because there was already West Germany unless East Germany was superior to West Germany. The whole point of the Eastern Bloc was that it would be superior to capitalism. It would be more abundant, more free, more whatever you wanted to measure on. Otherwise, it had no reason to exist. The problem was it wasn't superior. It measured itself based on the Western sphere of influence. 
I mean, we couldn't have rigged the game any better. The Western side. Communism was susceptible to the Western sphere of influence, and the West was more or less resolute. And when we had riots in the streets, it looked like weakness. But no, it was our society being more open and having corrective mechanisms. And when we had people on TV called useful idiots, talking about how the Eastern Bloc was better, and it was on our TV and then it went to theirs, and they said, look, it's from Western TV. It looked like our weakness, but of course, Obviously, it was our strength, because we were not afraid of alternative points of view and self-criticism, because we are a free society. There's power in freedom, if you know, if you understand that. This is all so very banal, and yet somehow we forgot about this, with stories of dissidents and roundtables, the KGB absolutely crushed the dissident movement. That's what the KGB documents show from the 1980s, and that's what the dissidents' own stories from the 1980s show. Crushed solidarity, drove it underground. You can say, well, still they were powerful underground. They were underground, and thousands were in jail. I got to tell you, communism was good at repression. That was one of the things it was good at. It wasn't good at the real game. The game wasn't tanks coming up over the ridge in the Korsk salient. The game was nylons. And they had no answer for that. They had the answer for the German tanks. The Soviet tanks were superior to the German tanks. Guderian wrote back in 43. Guderian, who invented the Blitzkrieg with his insubordination in France when he raced for the Channel after the, di the, the crazy crossing through the Ardennes forest of all those tanks. And he raced to the Channel against orders. And he cut the French off in the biggest encirclement imaginable. And this was Blitzkrieg because you eliminated the ability of the other side to fight. And it hadn't been in the plan. It happened because of his daring and his insubordination. He went against orders. Yeah, the Blitzkrieg didn't work because the Soviet tanks, not only did the Soviets have space, not only did they have many other factors, but they were good at tanks. They were good at all the military stuff. If the Cold War was about a military competition, the Soviets were good at that. They reached parity. And a lot of their weapons didn't jam. Didn't jam in the jungles. Didn't jam in the deserts. They were superior in difficult environments. But the daily life competition, no answer. You remember Tutsi with Dustin Hoffman? Soviet audience, East Bloc audience remembers it too. Why? Because Dustin Hoffman, dressed up in the crazy outfit, remember? Dustin Hoffman is in an apartment and he walks from one room to another room. And then he goes into another room. And then another room. And then another room. And the camera's following in another room, and the Soviet audience, the East Bloc, they're trying to count the rooms. Could somebody live like that? <laughs> is that what the West is like? And then he goes out on the street, and he's just walking down the street, and he passes a grocery shop. And you know what it shows? It shows gigantic piles of citrus, fruits, and vegetables right there. And he just walks by as if he doesn't even need it. He doesn't have an avos. He doesn't have a little sack to stuff the sack the way they did in the East Bloc. Because it's just life. Could they live like that in the West? It was hard to say because they weren't allowed to travel for the most part. Only the communists were allowed to travel. Gorbachev drove. In the 60s, he drove. He was allowed to drive to Italy and France with his wife in a beat-up Soviet car. And he saw the abundance, and he saw the freedom. He saw the civic activism. He saw the West. And then he saw the Prague Spring after the tanks had destroyed it. Yeah. 
it was a sphere of influence, and they were susceptible. Now, you're going to say to me, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, A, you're going on too long. B, all of this is obvious. C, where is it going? Where is this crazy lecture about fascism and communism going? And the answer is they lost, but so what? So what? They lost. So what? They were not collapsing. The dissidents were in prison or psychiatric hospitals. Remember Amnesty International? I remember. I was for a while a chapter head at Berkeley for Amnesty International. University of California, Berkeley. Yeah, they lost, but so what? Just because you lose doesn't mean you have to capitulate. But they did capitulate. They capitulated not on purpose. They capitulated because they wanted to revive themselves. They wanted to compete better. They wanted to do better in that geopolitical competition. So they embarked on reform. Socialist reform, socialism with a human face, communist reform, all of those words you know well. And of course, reform under communism is auto-liquidation. We saw it in 56. We saw it in 68. You give a little bit of freedom, they want all the freedom. You give a little bit of market, they want all the market. You say, okay, you can form political groups, they want to form parties. They want to break the communist monopoly. There is no equilibrium of reformed communism. There is no place where you go and you get from Stalinist communism to stable socialism with a human face. It's auto-liquidation. Not because only inherently within communism that possibility isn't there. It's because they're in a geopolitical context. They live in the Western world. They live under Western oil prices. They live under everything Western. Western financial system. And I could go on. And so Gorbachev attempts the revival. It's not an attempt to do the market, to do capitalism and a multi-party system. Not at all. It's an attempt, as you know, to revive the socialist system. The one party, but more dynamic. The controlled society, but with more dynamism. The controlled economy, but with more dynamism. Even Gaidar had no idea what a market economy was, let alone Gorbachev. If you read Gaidar forward, rather than backward, it's about Hungarian goulash communism. That's what his papers are about, about Yugoslav self-management and about all sorts of stuff except for the market and freedom. That's not what it's about, Gaidar. It was Gorbachev who introduced competitive elections. There was no imperative to do so. He introduced competitive elections. He forced it through the Politburo. He forced it on his own system. It was Gorbachev who dismantled the Communist Party machine from the inside, already in 1988. Why? Because he feared that there would be a revanche against him, like Khrushchev, that they would use the Communist Party machine, the conservatives, the anti-reformists, and they would take him down and end reform. That was his fear. So he sabotaged them. He took their mechanisms away. But you see, the Communist Party was the key to the Soviet system not being a federation in practice. The Soviet state was a federation, a voluntary federation with the right to secede according to the Constitution. There was an Estonia. There was a Ukraine. They had state borders. They had state institutions. They had federal powers. But all of that was negated by the centralism of the Communist Party, because the party wasn't federal, it was a pyramid. And the Communist Party of Ukraine had the same power as a, a village or provincial Communist Party in Russia. But once you eliminate 
the Communist Party's control mechanisms, you create, you establish the actual state federation. And the Lithuanian parliament begins to pass laws that contradict the Soviet constitution. And there's no Communist Party machine to stop it. It has been deliberately sabotaged by Gorbachev. To understand why the Soviet Union fell, you have to have understood that the Federation was real. That they were real states inside the Federation. And only the communist machine negated the Federation in practice. And once you remove the communist machine, you've got your Federation. And he did that. He did that. Then, of course, there was the opportunism, the tremendous opportunism. Once the system gets unhinged, there is desertion of the system for two reasons. First, you have, you can stay in power. The Soviet Union is imploding, but hey, there's Ukraine. I wasn't really much of a Ukrainian nationalist. I ran the military industrial complex in the Ukraine for the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union is unhinged and collapsing. All of a sudden, I'm a Ukrainian patriot. And I can stay in power because I can become the head of Ukraine or the head of Kazakhstan or the head of whatever it might be. Moreover, all this property that belongs to the state, who's the state? Who is the state? I hereby give myself this factory, signed myself. God, that was easy. We have a ridiculous notion that Anatoly Chubais privatized the former Soviet Union. They privatized it themselves. He tried to legalize a process that was deeply underway. You see, because communism is dead. You can't have as much property and self-enrichment on the communism. You know, they limited the size of your dacha. And if you exceeded the size of your dacha, they came and they forced you to dismantle it or they dismantled it yourself. You exceeded it by 10 square meters and they showed up with tools and they knocked that part down and they gave you a party reprimand. And if you paid a bribe to get around these rules, that was a bribe you had to pay to get around the rules. But you see, if you take away communism, there are no limits. You can just have it all. Forget about that pathetic Volgograd, or Volvograd in East Germany. How about not just driving a Volvo? How about owning the streets and the airport? And you name it. I hereby give the airport to myself. Signed myself. How about that? That process meant who's going to go to the wall to defend the system? Who in their right mind is going to try to save the system? You'll remember from 1984, actually, from Animal Farm, from Orwell's Animal Farm. You'll remember at the end of the farm, at the end of the novella, the pigs, the pigs are the communists, the pigs return the farm to Manor Farm. All that animal farm nonsense is over. Who, who, who had this crazy idea? So you know, communism was real. There was something to it. There was a leveling aspect. There was a working class aspect. There were a lot of things about communism that were significant. But it's gone now. Because you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have your property. It's not that hard to run an illiberal, market-oriented kleptocracy. And so communism is dead. But fascism is not. And the mechanism was the Western sphere of influence, the geopolitics, and Gorbachev's ill-fated well-intentioned, thank God he did it, attempt to reform the system. Now, there are many other things I could talk about. Talk about the wall, 
talk about Poland and solidarity. could talk in detail. I'm in print on all of these issues. I'd be happy to talk about them. I could talk about the myth of the Soviet failure to copy China. The Soviets started with agriculture. There was massive agricultural reform before Gorbachev was general secretary, when he was the central committee secretary responsible for agriculture already in the early 80s. It failed. I could talk about how the USSR was not crushed by the military industrial complex. No. Guess who produced the consumer goods in the Soviet Union? Who produced their refrigerators? The military industrial complex did. We have the secretariat of the military industrial complex. The files of the Secretariat of the Military Industrial Complex of the Soviet Union in the post-World War II period at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. The internal assessments of Star Wars. We have those documents. Those are like Cold War trophies. And you can read and see that the military industrial complex was the linchpin of the consumer economy. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have time. I want to go to three, a little bit about China, and then I want to conclude. I think we're about 10 minutes left. We have a story about China. And the story about the Soviet Union, as I said, doesn't work. Eastern Europe's story doesn't work unless the China story is in there. And we have this China story, which is Deng Xiaoping communist reform. Right? You know it well. The problem with that story is it's, once again, a mythology. You see, because this is how it happened. The crazy Maoist cultural revolution destroyed the economic planning mechanisms. Remember those economic planners? Remember anybody who wore glasses? They got deported to the countryside, if not beaten up. Right? That was the cultural revolution. It was a violent, semi-lunatic episode. We could go into all the reasons Mao launched it. We could go into the ramifications of how it unfolded in various different locales, the, the variation. But it was a self-destruction of planned economy capacity. And then, what happened? The peasants did not want to starve again. There had been gigantic, horrendous famines already. And so the peasants began to recreate market relations among themselves without the authority to do so. They decollectivized and they entered into market or barter relations that were outside the planning mechanism. And several hundred million people in the coastal areas, remember it's a monsoon civilization, so the wealth is in the south, not the north. The capital's in the north only because of the Mongol episode. Nobody would build a capital in that dust bowl today. Right? The wealth is down in the south, the monsoon civilization, the southern part, the coastal areas. Those peasants recreated the market. Yes, they did, in order not to starve. And the communists didn't want this to happen. There was a fight at the top, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82. You can trade on Tuesdays, but no other days. You can trade onions, but you can't trade rice. Each grudging decree after decree. Because they were communists. They didn't like markets. The thing that Deng Xiaoping did, which was very important, was not reform in that sense. As I say, the society did that, the peasants did that. The entrepreneurialism, yes, from below did that. It's very well documented. You read Yang from 96, you read Kei Zhou from 96. They have case studies of the localities where this happened. It can't penetrate the textbooks because, of course, mythologies are much stronger than facts. 
But where Dong did make a colossal impact was in the geopolitics, because what did he do? He switched partners. He went to the United States. He was four foot something tall, and he put on a cowboy hat that was almost as tall as he was at a rodeo. And he decided that China would de facto partner with, yes, guess what? The United States with the West. Why would he do that? Let's think about the sphere of influence argument once more. So here I'm China, and I'm next to this place, which is called Japan. And this place called Japan is destroyed in the war. And it rises from the ashes to become the second largest economy in the world. And I'm watching that because it's this far away. It's kind of like West Germany and East Germany. And then I'm watching Japan lift South Korea up in similar fashion with investment, technology transfer, manufacturing. And I'm watching this and I'm saying, you know what? This Western sphere of influence in the East is really powerful. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. Yeah. I'm watching this happen. It's on my doorstep. And what are they doing? They are selling to the United States domestic market. That's what they're doing. The reason why East Europe didn't work was because East Asia did. You see, the Poles couldn't pay their debt. The Romanians couldn't pay. Because they couldn't earn any foreign currency, they had nothing to sell to Western markets. But the East Asians could manufacture things that the biggest consumer engine in world history, the United States domestic market, wanted and paid for. And that was the answer. That was how you got wealthy. You got into the US market, and you were able to compete and sell things that Americans would want to buy. It was not a given. You can give anybody market access, and they won't succeed. They'd be crushed by the competition. But mainland China was up to the task. It was able to do it, like Japan. And so you say to yourself, that sphere of influence change, Deng Xiaoping. The Soviet model, forget it. The US is our de facto partner. And the US was willing to do this because of what? Because of geopolitics, because of the Soviet US competition. Because in the triangle, we could pull China to quote our side. I'm telling you, geopolitics is the driver and the foundation. And Deng Xiaoping made a colossal contribution because of this geopolitical shift. The communists take credit for the economic reforms, but they were belated and they were grudging and incomplete. What Deng did was to make it official policy in 92 when he took the southern tour after Tiananmen, when it looked like markets and liberalization was over. That was critical. But we're talking about well before then, when the peasants did it on their own. So here we have a story of geopolitics that works for the Soviets, for Eastern Europe, and for China too. I'll tell the story, move it up in time, and what happens with China post-Soviet Russia and the US in the next lecture. But let me now conclude part four the fourth and final part of the lecture. All right, we're right on time. So here we are. We have our round tables to celebrate the round tables. We have a wonderful story, we have heroes. But it doesn't look right, because this is not where we expect it to be. Remember all the stuff about countries that were partially free? Remember that nonsense? Remember the stuff about, quote, electoral democracy? Remember that garbage? There are people who have tenure to this day, luxurious university positions on that stuff. 
Now, it's electoral authoritarianism all of a sudden. It's the same mechanism and techniques, but somehow democracy got scratched and authoritarianism got inserted. Were we so deluded? What did we miss? We missed the losers. We are witnessing a loser's victory now. Democratic deficit, there was one. Democratic mechanisms, we have them. Political entrepreneurialism, yeah. Democratic deficit, democratic mechanisms, political entrepreneurialism, Orban. Democratic deficit, democratic mechanisms, political entrepreneurialism, Kaczynski, Putin, Trump, and you could go on. Voila. The political entrepreneurialism, however, is not taken for granted. That's the key ingredient. You see, you have to compete the way the Chinese did on the American market, the way we did in the Cold War. You gotta be up to the competition. You gotta know your strengths and the other side's weaknesses. And as Pope John Paul II said on his first trip back to Poland, be not afraid. That's the absolute key. You don't need stormtroopers in violence. You control the media, but that's nothing. You've got stories. You've got the most powerful thing in the world. You've got stories. You've got grievances. You've got enemies. You've got stories, stories that speak to the heart. We call these mendacious stories. We say they're lies. Brexit, all the promises. But stories are very powerful. What is authoritarianism? It's only four things. It's coercive mechanisms. You give me some coercive mechanisms, I can do a lot. For sure. You need a revenue stream. You don't have to grow the economy. You just need cash. The idea that there's some kind of bargain that authoritarians promise that if they raise the standard of living, the people will be okay with not having freedoms. That's garbage. That's nonsense. And what, if the standard of living doesn't go up, the authoritarians are gonna say, you know, we violated the bargain, we're gonna leave power now. There's no bargain, social contract. The people haven't given up their freedom willingly, in some cases, and the authoritarians are not gonna admit that they didn't hold up their side of the bargain if the standard of living doesn't go up. They're just gonna use the coercive mechanisms, but not only. You see, because if you have the revenue stream, whatever it might be, oil, gas, diamonds, um, accounts in the Federal Reserve that don't belong to you that you somehow penetrate, like Bangladesh's account, and wire it to yourself through Malaysia, like the, South Kore the North Koreans did, right? You just need revenue. You need a revenue stream. It's not that complicated. You need control over life chances. You need control, of, you need to be able to reward and punish people. So if your state employment is high, people are dependent on you, right? The whole middle class in Russia, the part that's still left, they're state employees. And if they don't like the policy and they decide to voice that, their life chances change because the regime has control over life chances. Yeah. So you need coercive mechanisms, a revenue stream, control over life chances, not total control, but enough to reward and punish. It's not that complex. But the fourth thing you need, and the first three are brittle without the fourth, is you need stories. You need a well. You need a well. And you need to, down in that well, put the bucket and come up. Grievances, enemies, nationalism. You got to have stories in the well, and those wells have to be deep because you have to keep going back to them and back to them and back to them. And you're not afraid of criticism because you have an alternative story. You're not just suppressing, you're promoting your story. And these stories have resonance. There was national glory, and it escaped us, or it was stolen from us. They took our territory away. 
They gave us gypsies or foreigners or immigrants or fifth column. When you, you know the, the drill very well. We can recapture this national glory. We have to fight our enemies. And so you have to give me more power. More and more power so that I can fight on your behalf. This is elementary. This is illiberalism. This is what fascism looks like today. You don't need, as I said, the stormtroopers and the violence. Sure, some of that you may employ. But if you've got coercive mechanisms, a revenue stream, control over life chances, and a well of stories, you're strong. Unless there's a geopolitical counterweight. Yeah. Unless the outside world isn't that friendly. Unless there's pressure from the outside. Because the outside world lives better. Or the outside world denies you access to the things you need. Let's call that the international banking system. Right? Yeah. No authoritarianism without the geopolitical factor either. Geopolitics either inhibits or facilitates authoritarian regimes. Yeah. There's either complacency, decay, refusal to spend money on a real military, offshoring, gone amok. There's either all of that, or there's instead resolve. Alliance building, institution building, punishment of those who transgress. Yeah. You know which one we've got now. And you know why authoritarianism, not globally flourishing, certainly not globally flourishing, but eating away, eating away at the liberal rules-based international order. That's easy to criticize and definitely should be criticized, but its absence is a whole new game, potentially. So communism is over. It's not coming back. Illiberalism is alive. And the enormity of the tragedy of the left, the enormity of the tragedy of the left across the 20th and the 21st century is still not even appreciated at an elementary level. Thank you for your time. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, so much um, to talk about, and uh, we have just about half an hour uh, to discuss those issues. So, um, with the privilege of the moderation, let me ask you the, the first question to get us going. Um, could, could I ask you to comment, uh, given your conclusion, what role does the current administration and president in the U.S. have on these illiberal tendencies uh, in the sphere of influence that the West still is? Uh, thank you for that question. We talked a little bit about that the first lecture. I talked about how, you know, the CIA tried to destroy the Soviet Union from without and failed. It had a fantasy of destruction of communism. And then the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union began to destroy the system from within, and the CIA watched that process and couldn't believe that was going on. I mentioned that Trump is not Gorbachev. The United States is not on the verge of collapse, nor is the West. So the analogy is imperfect, but we're in a kind of strange and crazy situation where the enemies couldn't do to the United States and the West, what now the leader is doing. My view is it's a very precarious situation. I don't, uh, I don't predict the future. I don't think uh, it necessarily has to end badly. The West has had periods of uh, misrule. Incompetence is the single most important uh, dimension 
of politics in Washington, not ideology, but incompetence. We have overcome episodes that were very significantly bad, that were self-created. And so it could be that this is a passing phase. It could be even that the current administration shifts in a different direction. You know, if you read John Kennedy's inaugural, January 20th, 1961, it's very short. He talked about, we will bear any burden, we will meet any challenge, every foe and friend should know that we will defend freedom in every corner of the world. Yeah, that was all correct. Now, the execution of that was often poor. And the Vietnam War is a prime, but not the only example. The Iraq War more recently. We all know the critique, but the resolve, we forget. The problem is to translate this into effective mechanisms and effective policies. You can know what your values are, and you can fail to defend them properly. We're now in a situation where we've even forgotten what the values are, let alone fail to defend them properly. So as I said, it's a precarious situation, but I don't make any predictions. It could shift, and we've overcome things like this before. I will say, however, that when people break the rules, when they transgress, when freedom is threatened, you got to be there. There have to be punishments. Orban cannot get away with what he does. Kaczynski cannot get away with some of the stuff he does. EU was better on Poland than it was on Hungary, in part because Hungary came first. And they saw what a big black guy it was to do nothing. Now, you can say mechanisms are poor, levers are weak, don't have that much leverage over the situation. That's not an excuse. Who are we? What are our values? Why are we here? How did we get here? What do we stand for? The same thing has to be said for the people in Washington. Those who call themselves the establishment, what are they made of? Is it Volvograd? Or is it something better than that? And we're waiting to see. Absolutely waiting to see. And just as a, as a one second follow-up question, would you say that just as the world and the West were caught by surprise by 89, that the, there was a, an element of surprise by the liberal turn? There was delusion. My, the first part of my talk was all about delusion. The idea that intellectuals, for example, make history. This is the single biggest delusion in the academy. Because the intellectuals write all the books about history, don't we? We do. Yes, we do. And we, we put ourselves at the center of the story. And when something is heroic, we give ourselves agency. And when something is less than heroic, we begin to talk about structural factors. Or betrayal. That's a great trope for intellectuals. Betrayal, how something was really good, and then it got sidetracked, or betrayed, or usurped, or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. So, yes, of course we missed it because we were looking at ourselves and talking about ourselves. And we weren't talking about society. We weren't talking about the losers. We weren't talking about history. We weren't talking about all the things that we're now talking about, which, of course, were not inevitable, but are part of a prior story that we can all now point to in retrospect the way everyone predicts the day after on cable TV, right? And so, yeah, we did. But, you know, not everyone. <coughs> not everyone. There are people, and we know who they are, and we can look back at them, who said things in real time. You know, Raymond Aron, in the 50s, when Sartre was at his peak, he said, I'm an intellectual, and I'm on the right. Yeah. He understood communism before others did. He understood freedom. And this was very important. It wasn't 1989 or 1992 or 1995. It was, 19, it was Czeslav Miłosz. 49, he wrote that book, Captive Mind. Right? So there were people who knew then, early, and now we separate them out as heroes. 
because they were more prescient, because they understood what the values and principles, what was at stake, right? They were never <coughs> Stalinists who then went the other way. But let's give credit to those people too, like Kolakovsky, right? Unlike Michnik, for example. Kolakovsky was a true believing Stalinist for a time. But he figured things out. And look what he did as a result. Well, we can do the same thing now with our history. We can go back to 89. We can go back to the 70s. We can look at Poznansky on Poland. We can look at Roman Laba on Poland. Right? There's a lot of stuff that was there in real time. And in the 90s too. And we can sift that history. And we can find where we are now in people who saw that coming. And it's not the majority, but those are our beacons. And it's left and right who saw. It's not one side or the other that saw. I'm a nonpartisan person. I don't belong to a political party. I'll add Milo Angelis to your list of many, many. Yes. Uh, so let's open it now, and I'll group questions by three so that we can fit most in. So let's take the front row here. And I've... Oh. So I have a question about the nature of the changes of the American economy. Yeah. Because it seemed to me that an important part of your story was a growing economy that actually produced goods and raised the standard of living for a very large number of people. Yes. And, you know, reading, re reading the news, it just seems to me that the, that the shift to a service economy, and I don't know whether it is accurate to say there's a larger proportion of the economy now placed played by finance. But I wonder whether when you, when you say we've forgotten our values, that part of this is because the economy itself is changing and more and more people are less optimistic in a way that they were during the years that, 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 that you were discussing. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I was fully convinced by your description of the collapse of communism, uh, also as a witness of many, many uh, events at that time. Um, well, I uh, am not so completely convinced or, um, by your arguments about uh, why um, the uh, um, liberal and authoritarian tendencies are coming up now, for instance, in Europe. Um, what is the main trigger, or what are the main triggers for that? And uh, I'm just, uh, in, uh, with respect to that question, just another small question. You know uh, the theory, I think, Roderick, uh, about uh, not uh, um, the, the impossibility uh, of globalization, of national state and democracy. And um, I am um, asking this question, especially uh, with respect to European Union, because we are living here, and uh, we are all, or at least not all, but some people are very worried about uh, what is happening here. Thank you. Um, I think that's a little bit in the same vein. Uh, there's a lot of commentary globally in the West that inequality is basically one of the, of the big uh, enemies within the West. Yeah? Maybe you can comment on that. And uh, maybe the same issue, just from a different perspective, because you mentioned the misses and the, the histories yes. that the, uh, that the um, authoritarian regimes, you may even call it religions, that they sort of uh, create or propagate. What is the myth or the religion uh, for the West yes. in the future? That's the question. Yep. That's the exact question. Okay. Thank you. That is it. So let's talk a little bit about the American economy. So. If you eliminate markets and private property, you can't have freedom. We know that because there's history. Every case where that's been done, freedom was lost. And economic dynamism was also lost. And that's why communism is dead. Because the elites understand this problem, even if the academy doesn't fully understand it yet. OK. So when you have a dynamic market economy, it does a lot of stuff. And some of the things it does, you know, cause massive disruption. That's what dynamism is about. There's this, 
you know, fanciful, wonderful term, creative destruction that comes from Schumpeter, right? Okay, it's not actually creative destruction. There's a, a chaotic quality to it that's much more than creative destruction because there's, there's chaos even in the success. This is Hyman Minsky talks about how uh, su economic success leads you to misprice risk, that when markets go up, people misprice risk and they take greater risks and so there's an inherent instability in market success, right? That's Minsky's work. We understand this. That's just the way things are. Why should we uh, um, react as if that's a shock to us? But let's talk about your inequality issue or your issue of, you know, when America produced things. It was the services and finance. Yeah, so let's think about this. Let's go back to 1946. What was the percentage of the global GDP of the U.S. economy in 46. Yeah, 50 percent. 50 percent. Yeah. So this is, it's easy to do. Let's destroy, let's have World War II. Let's kill 55 million people. Let's destroy everybody's infrastructure, their housing. Let's just kill it all. And, but the U.S., no fighting on its territory. Instead, the war is an economic boom. And now, the rest of the world is flattened. And so what's the U.S. going to have from 46, right, through the first oil shock? It's going to have a pathway that you can't recreate. There's no going back to 46 and 47 and 48 and the 50s and the 60s and when my father worked in a factory and brought a house, right? You're not going to work in a factory and buy a house outside of certain specific circumstances, right? Those circumstances can't be recreated. You can't go back to that because you have to destroy the free world to get that lift behind the U.S. So you're left with, you're left with the consequences of success. The consequences of success, right? Because success breeds more trouble than failure does. Failure is easy. Success, however, creates all sorts of interest groups it polarizes and locks down a political system as the interest groups gain control over it, right? The winners, for example, gain control. Okay, Trump representing the losers seems to make a breakthrough, but obviously it's not a breakthrough for those who are on the losing end, right? So this is just the cost of success. So what you need are corrective mechanisms. You need lower cost of entry into markets. You need to break market power of people who can prohibit the entry of others. You need greater investment in education and skills and training and community colleges, not Harvard's and Stanford's, right? You need all of those things that reintroduce dynamism into an ossified system and that open up opportunity. But what's our conversation about? It's about redistribution because we have a sense of fairness, we have an important sense of fairness, and that important sense of fairness leads us to say, you know, we have to redistribute it because some have too many. I was not asking about that. Go ahead. I, it, it seemed to me that the, that the growing econ American economy in the 50s and 60s had obvious benefits to an increasing number of people. In yes. America. Yes, and it did. it's not clear to me that is the case now. So I'm not making an argument yes. for redistribution. Yes. I'm simply wondering why is it that people in America are not feeling optimistic in the way that they were before? I'm not saying we have to go back. Yeah, I agree with you completely. That, but I'm saying that that's a consequence of success. You know, I quoted the, the greatest living, the preeminent philosopher today in the first lecture, Louis C.K. And what he said was, you know, everything is amazing and nobody is happy. Right? And that's it. That's what you're saying. And I agree with that. I'm only saying that that's a consequence of success. That that doesn't surprise me. And moreover, that that's not something that was easily preventable. And so what you're dealing with then is you need policies and levers, right, that break ossified structural power and reintroduce the openness that you had before, which form these wealthy, powerful interest groups, right? Now, you can say that it's easier said than done, and I agree, right? 
But that's what public policy is. Public policy is about what you can do as well as what you need to do. Right? It's not about what would be you know, good in a book uh, published by Central University Press or whatever. Right? That's a different type of policy. Policy is what you can do when you know, billionaires can buy politicians and those kinds of things. Right? That's where you have to have policy. That's where you have to be clever. And so my view is, you know, we have a tremendous amount of manufacturing in the United States right now. We have an incredibly dynamic manufacturing economy. It just doesn't employ people the same way. The rate of employment in manufacturing is lower than it was before, largely because of automation, once again, largely because of success. This is the problem. The EU expanded to 28, and now it seems like it's a shambles, right? It's success that gives you the problems. It's not a shambles, it's success. But within the success, you have to reinsert the element of dynamism, because it's all about dynamism and these corrective mechanisms. And the only way to do that right, is through coalition politics, is through the sausage making, it's through resistance in the streets, it's through electing people, it's through applying pressure, and it's through political entrepreneurialism. So here's the answer to that other question. You know, how come things are in Europe the way they are now? And like I said, the key ingredient is political entrepreneurialism. That's the key ingredient. Because if you have ineffective politicians, things don't happen. If you have effective politicians, they can catalyze. People say there's a brush fire. It was waiting to happen. Somebody needed to light the fuse. Well, yeah, somebody needed to light the fuse. That's the whole story of political entrepreneurialism. If you're ineffective as a politician, you don't last. Someone else more effective comes and beats you. We're going to see this now in France, right? In days. What are we, four days away from the election in France? We're going to see who had the entrepreneurialism. Right? It's very hard to read because we read it through a prism that doesn't give us as direct access as we need. We instead have this tremendous filter problem. But the political entrepreneurialism is the key variable. And so Europe needs political entrepreneurialism on the anti-populist side. That's what it needs. If people came along who were effective, they had the story to tell about national greatness and about how that's connected to openness and immigration and economic dynamism and investment in education and whatever else they might tell that story. And they were good at telling that story. And they were good at rebutting their competitors. Right? We would have that story then. We would be in that position. The problem is globalization, international identity, transnational identity, is always minoritarian by definition. And nationalism is always majoritarian by definition. Always. And so people are ignoramuses who try to tell transnational stories not rooted in a national one. What they're telling you is, I want to be in the minority. I don't want to fight for the, for the majority. Nationalism is pliable. The content of nationalism is not given. National stories can be flipped. You can only be an internationalist if you can tell that in an effective national story. There is no other way. And if you can't tell your internationalism in an effective national story, I can predict what's going to happen to you. You're going to end up in the minority. Someone else is going to come along, a political entrepreneur, and they're going to seize the national card, and they're going to play it because they're skillful, and they're going to crush you. And you're going to say they're lying, they're mendacious, they're, they're telling people what people want to hear, but they're not, never going to give it to them. And I said, what, what are you telling people? You're not, your story isn't mendacious also? In answer to your question about all the glory that's going to come to the majority, supposedly, from the openness. So the illiberal tendencies, the problem is you need a counter-national story. And that counter-national story has to be effective. It has to win people over in a competitive marketplace known as democracy. Right? Democracy is a corrective mechanism in a big way. The only trouble with democracy is when you can use it to eliminate it. 
Right? That's what Goebbels was about. Right? Remember him? He, he kept saying, this democracy is amazing. It's our greatest tool. We use it, we get into power, and then we end it. Right? That's when democracy runs into trouble. Right? And that's where we're on the cusp here with the Orban stuff, with Erdogan. Right? That's where we're on the cusp. But those people can't bank in North Korea. Turkey and Hungary cannot do their banking in North Korea. They can't have an economy without the Western banking system. The levers of power that we have over them are life and death, existential, if we understood that and we use that. Right? So, but we need a competitive story to beat them in addition to using the mechanisms, understanding the power that we have. You know, about the inequality. The, um, the era of equality the post-World War II era, is not uh, the principal historical story. If you look at history, inequality is much more typical. However, if you have a Great Depression, which was incredibly destructive of wealth, and you have a war, which was incredibly destructive of wealth, you can equalize things. How you get to a more equal point Without a Great Depression and without war, nobody's answered that question yet. I don't want the Great Depression and I don't want the war to get to the position where working class people can buy housing again, right? Just because they work conscientiously. Right? My father had no college education. I was the first in the family to go to college. <clears throat> he had the manufacturing job that worked in that epoch. I have the intellectual labor job that works in this epoch, right? But I benefited from the, the economic and human capital that he was able to acquire in that ep epoch that now people like him can't do the same and their kids can't enjoy the kind of benefits, right? So it's, it's not something that anybody is evil, that anybody did wrong. It's not a conspiracy, right? It's not something that is necessarily uh, uh, bad even. It's, it's the way the world works. However, you get inside that system and you tweak and you push. The story of social mobility is very mixed. There is a, a, a media version of the story which corresponds 99% to the leftist uh, understanding of the world. And then there's a sociological story in the sociology literature which is highly variegated and full of interesting stuff including natural experiments about how things got better for whole communities, right? But we can't get to the sociological story because we're, we have a political story that is really hard for us to, uh, to give up because it's dear to our hearts, right? So it's going to be hard to get anywhere near that. It's going to be very hard. Finally, let me say one more thing. You know, it's very easy to be a pessimist. Pessimism comes naturally to me. And the reason pessimism beats optimism is because, A, you're always right. If you predict things are going to be bad, somehow they are. And you look good. But if you make a mistake, you predict bad stuff and good stuff happens, you're even better off. Because when you're wrong, it's because the world is a better place as a result. Right? So pessimism is wonderful. And it's very easy as I say, for me, um, uh, sort of, I don't know, uh, it's, it's kind of in, <clears throat> in my DNA to be pessimistic. But the story I'm telling today is an optimistic story. It's a story about the right values, about tremendous accomplishments, about colossal success. What's China today compared to Mao? Can you describe it as anything other than a colossal success? What's India today compared to 1947? You know all the problems of China. You know all the problems of India. But is, is the situation now not incredible, successful? What about the European Union? My God, the European Union is astonishing. It's amazing, the European Union. I could tell you all the problems just like you could. And, you know, the currency and the union without... I mean, we can all talk about that till we're blue in the face. But do we remember a different history in Europe? Yeah. And is this history significantly better? Yeah. 
So the problems are real, and we need a better analysis of them in addition to mechanisms on them. But we have to learn that success is the challenge. We have to rise to the success. We can't retreat and, and faint and, and lose our nerve just because we have success. Thank you, Professor Kotkin. Um, I will now end this session, given that we're on time, with apologies to those who wanted to ask questions. But let me just add everything that you already know, that we're in the middle of a fascinating journey uh, down a road that Professor Kotkin is taking us. And we are impatient to reach to the final point in the third lecture uh, next Wednesday. So. Uh, please keep your questions, uh, those of you who wanted to ask, again, with my apologies. But at the end, please join me in thanking Professor Kotkin for this second lecture. <laughs>